Did I say something? Wow. Man, that came out fast, didn't it? You know, he was afraid to go to church when he was a child. He was afraid because of a creature called the zeal. The zeal. True story. His mother realized the reason for Teddy's fear was a scripture uh, that he had heard the uh, pastor read, or the pastor read. It was John chapter 2, verse 17. Are you ready? It is written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. <laughs> You know, Teddy didn't really know what that verse meant. And, you know, there's other parts of the Bible that I believe some of us may or may not know what they mean. And, uh, and that can cause fear in us. Amen? That can cause us to kind of like, whoa, we better watch out. Two of those passages we read today, verses 27 and, verses th and verse 30, right? Uh, you ever get concerned when you take uh, the Lord's Supper? You know, there was a pastor friend of mine who told me, he said, you know what? Every time when I was younger, and I, every time I took the Lord's Supper, he says, I thought, listen, I thought I was risking my life. And it wasn't because of the juice and the bread, right? Although some bread can be real stale, amen? But he said this, he said, what would happen if I ate the bread and drank the cup in an unworthy manner? And he says, and how is I supposed to know what an unworthy manner was? Anybody ever have those kind of questions? Well, eventually, he said his fears subsided, but it was not until quite a few years later that he really started to understand what the Lord is saying to us through this particular text. As a matter of fact, um, he says he's also grown to realize what a wonderful privilege we as Christians have in coming to the Lord's table together. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You see... This before us, yes, is the Lord's table. Yes, it is for the Lord's Supper. But before a meal, we all had one thing in common. You know, we couldn't wait to be called to the table, right? Anybody ever seen those old westerns? I like watching old westerns. You, you hear the, uh, was the chow wagon feller, the cook, whatever it is. Ding, 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 ding. And it says, it's time for supper. Now, I want to tell you something. There was not a lot of folks that stayed away from the supper table when it was time for supper. Amen? And if you look at me, I've not stayed away from the supper table very often myself. Amen? And that's okay. But when somebody says, time to eat, it's time to eat. Right? Well, when we observe communion or the Lord's Supper, Jesus has set the table and He's inviting us to come to His table. Now, if you turn over to the book of John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 27. John chapter 6 verse 27 says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for Him hath God the Father sealed. Now Jesus is speaking to a group of people right here that, that He has, uh, or is about to, or has just fed. And uh, He just fed them. And, and He points out the fact that there, there's better reasons to follow Him than for getting a temporary fill of fish and crackers. Right? <laughs> give you an illustration to prove that point. Does anybody know what you call a stray dog you give a little food to? A pet. Right? You give a little stray dog a little bit of food and that, that dog is now yours. You now own that dog. That dog will stay right beside you. But as a matter of fact, uh, the question comes, will he find more than just food in you? Will he find a place uh, that has family? Will he be loved? Or will he be dropped off on the side of the road somewhere? Maybe in a better neighborhood, right? Or is he going to fall victim to an unfortunate accident? You know, who knows? But these people were following Jesus. Jesus uh, had just fed these people and now they're following Him. But now He's telling them about the bread of life. Now He's trying to help them understand that I've got something better than just to fill your tummies for just a little while. Look at verse 31. John chapter 6 and verse 31. He says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
You know, what, what was going on here? Um, I believe they wanted the Lord to top the miracle of what He just performed, of feeding all those people. Okay? There was a lot of people that would follow the Lord and, and they would say, I wonder if He can top that. I wonder if He can top that. I wonder if He can do better than that. Right? Anybody ever watch... Uh, Anybody ever, ever watch uh, magic shows, illusion shows, all those? I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm I love watching those things, right? Because there's no magic; it's just illusion. It's 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 sleight of hand. It's a trick. It's trickery, right? But I like to try to figure out how they do the trick. That's just me. I'm I'm a I'm, I'm an old funny dude when it comes to that. And I want to tell you something. Those tricks that used to be done years ago are not done today. Why? Because that doesn't, that doesn't wow people anymore. Did you know that? It just doesn't wow them anymore. They have to come up with bigger and better and better ways to top that. And if you're not careful, you'll go to a church and you're going to have to, you'll go to a church and you'll say, yeah, well, that was good, but it's got to get better. You've got to top that. If it's a church that draws people with entertainment, that's what's going to have to happen. If you have, if you have one, one well-named uh, person come up and sing, well, you have to get somebody even better the next time. It becomes an arms race. And I want to tell you, you've got to be careful when you do all of that, whether it's in your family, you know, the neighbor has a car, so then you have to get a better car, right? Well, what happens when the neighbor gets a better car than that? Well, I guess I'll have to go get me a better car. <laughs> Not me. Nope. You say you don't want a new car? Absolutely. You want to give me one? I'll take it. Amen? Matter of fact, I talked to Dick this morning. I've, I've already got first dibs on his truck, right? He wants to give it up for adoption. Hey, I'll adopt it anytime. Amen? Amen? But they wanted the Lord to top that miracle. Look at verses 32 and 33. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. You know, their mouths are watering. They can't wait. And kind of licking their chops. And, uh, and they're wondering, Don't tease us. When are you going to give us this bread? Right? Well, verse 35 continues. It says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, but he that believeth on uh, shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And they said, What? I believe many of them felt let down by that. Many of them looked and said, Really? That's it? You? I really think that's the way it is. I believe that's the way a lot of people in the world are today too. Really? That's it? Yeah. That's it, but you don't have a clue what you're talking about. In verses 41 and 42, it says, The Jews then murmured at Him because He said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they, and they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I am come down from heaven? Friends, they're not really thrilled with his claim. And they don't believe him. And they aren't getting the picture here. But we must make sure we understand what's going on. Go down to verse 48. Verse 48 says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just... <laughs> well, they're dead. All right. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus said, I'm the main course. You say, cannibalism? No, it's called an analogy. He's saying, listen, I am the one that's going to help you get to heaven. I am the one that's going to help you not, not uh, hunger again or thirst again. It's a spiritual analogy that he's using. And he's saying, and, and they're still looking at him and they're saying, what? Right? They still don't get it. Verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're thinking he's some kind of Dracula telling a young couple to come over and he'd like to have them for dinner or something, right? It's not cannibalism Christ is advocating. 
It is true Christianity, realizing that His body and His blood are the real spiritual sustenance that's going to sustain a Christian life. Amen? Amen. Hang in there, I know, I know. I know I'm making you think this morning, but hang in there, it's good. Now go to verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink His blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. <laughs> he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by, my, uh, by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Friends, it's not a, a phys physically appetizing thing, but spiritually speaking, it's the best eating you'll ever experience. Amen? The best eating you're ever going to experience is, is eating on that bread that the Lord Jesus Christ can offer. And only He can offer that. Amen? Psalm 34, 8 says this, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. You know, bread sustains life. It does. Jesus' body is the bread. So we've got to trust in the sacrifice that's been made by that broken body. Bread is life. You know, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. You see, bread will sustain life. Blood is life. Blood is life. Now, when Jesus' blood was shed, His life was being poured out. And all who will kneel at the foot of the cross and receive that life in a sin-cleansing, life-giving bath will be saved. That's where the song comes up. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Woo! I love that song, don't you? Maybe not as much. Friends, they didn't get it in Jesus' day, but we do now. Amen? We get it now. Or we should. It's not about really eating the flesh and drinking the blood. It's the elements before us on this table that symbolize His body and His blood. And there's no, say, there's no saving power in the elements. There is nothing that will save you as a result of eating and drinking what we have here today. Everybody with me? Now, so what do we do? What is this? Friends, this is a time of remembrance. And this is a time only for those who have been saved by that sacrificial body and blood that we've just talked about. Everybody up to date now? So now we're coming up to this thing called the Lord's Supper. Notice what has taken place in, 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 uh, in, in, that we've already read in the book of John. Now we're coming forward and we're going we're gonna to talk about the, the Lord's table itself. There are some things that we need to bring to the table today. Things we need to bring to the table. Number one, before we sit down to a meal, we need clean hands. Now, I don't know many people that will work in a garden. Uh, oh, I don't know what else you do. Work in a garden, take out the garbage. Uh, you know, do something with your hands, then come inside, sit down, and eat dinner. Anybody? You know what that is? That is ew. You know what that is, really? <laughs> so, uh, where, where have you been? Well, I've just been, I just been down the sewer line. <laughs> really? I couldn't tell, right? Hadn't made a trip to the bathroom or any sink to wash their hands. They sit down and say, would you like some? <laughs> no, I don't. We need, to, we need to wash up first. Amen? How many times did your mama and daddy have to tell you, wash up before supper? Yeah! you got to wash up. Wash your hands. Wash up. Now, this is, this is why the Bible tells us to examine our lives before receiving communion. When we examine ourselves, the Bible commands it. When we examine ourselves, that is us getting ready to come to the supper table. 
Everybody with me? So now what's happening is, is we are looking inside to see where am I dirty at? Where do I need to clean up? What do I need to clean up to get ready to go to the supper table? That's what that means. You ready? Here's number next. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11.28. It says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, um, you know, we see something that needs to be confessed. We need to confess it. Um, anybody ever have to go to bed without supper sometimes because you got in trouble? Anybody ever do that? Yeah. Um, and, when, you know, the thing is, is, is we get in trouble, we have to go to bed. No supper. We did something bad. But friends, when we come to Jesus with remorse and repentance, we find forgiveness, restoration, and an invitation to His table. That's what we find. You see, Brother Don, I'm afraid of what I might find in my heart. And here's the thing. It's, it's, it's okay. Because God already knows. He just wants you to know what you find in your heart. Right? And He wants you to be remorseful. He wants you to be repentant of what's in your heart. By the way, He's not a bit scared of what you'll find. He is ready, willing, and able to forgive and to restore and to invite you to His table. Amen? Well, none of us are worthy to participate truly. We truly are not. But if we've trusted Christ, we're eligible. We are eligible and He invites us. He authorizes us to come to His table. He commands us to come. You know, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, it says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in His holy place? He that hath clean hands, listen, and a pure heart. Pure heart. Well, first we have to have clean hands. What's another thing? Number two, we, before dining, we, we also need to have a good appetite. A good appetite. What would happen if a friend of yours invited you to go uh, and have dinner with them? You say, hey, amen, right? But what if along the way you decided to get a few Twinkies and Ho-Hos and Ding-Dongs and chips and soft drinks and, and, just, and, just, and just eat to your heart's content, right? Or whatever all the junk food is you eat. I don't like any of those, but uh, ugh. but anyway. And then you get over to the place and they, they have this big feast. And you say, I'm really not hungry, thanks. Right? Now, I do know that there are ladies that have done that so they won't eat so much in front of their boyfriends when they go out on dates. Yeah, that's okay. You know. We're going to find out your appetite one day. Just saying. We know you long enough. We'll know you're a chow hound, right? Don't put on a show. So now, you come to your friend's house. You're, you're totally full. You know what happens, though? After all the junk food, no appetite for the good stuff. Biscuits and gravy. Oh. Let's just imagine that for now. No. <laughs> All the good stuff. Paul tells us, he says, you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You can't have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. You say, if I eat ho-hos and ding-dongs, I'm, I'm eating demons. No, 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 no. But here's what happens. We allow so much junk to get into our lives. We feast on the world. We feast on all the things being offered, even spiritual junk food. And when it comes time for the good stuff, we just have no appetite for it. And the Lord says... You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. 1 Corinthians 10.21 says this. It says, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk. You know, God offers us a, a very substantive meal. This bread and cup won't fill us physically, but it will satisfy our spiritual hunger in order that we do not feast on the junk food. 
We need to taste and see according to Psalm 34, 8. Amen. Dr. Leroy Creasy of Cornell University, he's identified a chemical in grapes that reduces the risk of heart disease. As a matter of fact, he reported in the Journal of Applied Cardiology, how's that for a nerd publication right there, amen? That grape juice lowers cholesterol, cleanses the grape juice. Grape juice, you looking? Lowers cholesterol, cleanses the heart of life-threatening impurities. Oh, but I need wine. It'll do better. <laughs> yeah, it'll do better. All right. At the Lord's table, by the way, the grape juice represents this blood of Christ. What does the blood of Christ do? Exactly what that grape juice does in our, in our physical walk. It cleanses the heart. Amen? That's what it's there for. Friends, we're all in the world, but we ought not be of the world. We get exposed to sin, and, but with God's help, we can resist temptation. And the thing is, do we get an appetite for what God has for us? See, when we dwell in the things below, we have no appetite for the things above. None. Matthew 5 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. They'll be filled. You know, what does Jesus say when He says we'll be filled? I think a lot of people personally live their lives on empty. They go day to day without much purpose or meaning in their life. And when they get to the end of their life, they wonder what was the point of even living in the first place. And they die starving spiritually. You know, Jesus is what we're truly hungry for. And the good news is, He's inviting us to His table to fill us. Amen. Oh, that's good. Preach it, Brother Don. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Amen. Number three, next quick, when we're dining, we also need patience. In other words, we need time to enjoy the moment. We live in a fast food world, even in our homes, right? We don't take time to make the meal like we used to. Right? Microwaves, convection, whatever. It's faster the better. Not necessarily. Anybody ever wonder why the chairs in McDonald's and Burger King are not real comfortable? Well, they don't want you to get comfortable. Why? They want you out of there. Why? So there's more room for other customers. Hello? Right? Friends, I have to admit, and I hate to admit this, that I've looked at the clock after one of my sermons and On at least one occasion, I know that I've served communion in a hurried manner. And I know that maybe there's some folks that are sitting out there saying, I wish he'd hurry up and get done, right? But we're to take our time when it comes to the Lord's table so that our spiritual meal can be fulfilling. Number four, you know, we also need harmony at the table. We need harmony at the meal table. You know, I heard about a family who got together for a meal, and before long, the table conversation turned to things like politics, uh, religion, all that. And before you know it, guess what? World War III in the family, right? It was awful. Horrible. The enjoyment of the meal got ruined. Amen? Now... We cannot expect everybody in our congregation to agree on every issue. But we are expected to get along. Amen? Amen? <coughs> you know, Paul makes a point of saying we are one body and we partake of one bread. Conflict, tension, disharmony, they ruin a perfectly good meal. What unites us, though, is greater than what divides us. Number five, we need gratefulness for the meal. Jesus gave thanks and so should we. <laughs> Saw an apron in a gift catalog one time that says, kiss the cook. <laughs> By the way, his last name was Cook. No, I'm kidding. Kiss the cook. You know, those who prepare meals appreciate being told that people enjoy their meal. On Wednesday nights, if, if, I, if I have the privilege of grilling out, 
I'm not looking for the praise of men, but it's good that people enjoy the meal. I do that so people can enjoy the meal. Uh, Joanne and Judy and Suzanne and uh, Sandy and whoever all else is in there, uh, they, they enjoy uh, when other people enjoy the meal. That, that's why we do it. It's a ministry that they have to you. And it's, it's really neat. If, if you're enjoying the meal, that means you can gossip about somebody else. Well, I mean, you can talk about something else while you're at the table. Amen? <laughs> Friends, when we come as a church to the Lord's table, we need to eat with gratitude. By the way, we don't need to take it for granted either. Number six, we also need to come to God's table with loyalty. Um, we avoid the competition. You know, if your family owned a restaurant, you, uh, you might go there frequently and tell others about it. Amen? And what Paul is trying to do, and what Paul... Is, Paul? Paul? Oh, Paul? Paul is telling us, he said, people try to eat at the devil's table and then try to come and eat at God's table too. As a matter of fact, um, we serve a jealous God. And He will not be replaced. He will not be... Listen, there are no replacements. There are no substitutes. He demands our undivided loyalty. And I have to check up on myself to wonder... Am I giving Him my undivided loyalty? He's our top priority. Preeminence in our lives. Number next. What am I on? Seven. There we go. We need to leave the Lord's table with purpose. Friends, this is spiritual nourishment and strength for us. But the question is, strength for what? Strength for what? You know, God would have us to be energized for a purpose. <laughs> And that is to serve Him with all of our strength. You know, we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all that we are, all of our strength. How do you get strength? Nourishment. And the thing about it is, there, we're going to be a mighty weak Christian if we don't nourish our spirit. Amen? And then we wonder why Nothing good is happening in the United States or in the world for God. Because I believe many Christians are failing to nourish themselves on the spiritual food. To build that spiritual strength to be used of God. I believe, I believe Christians sometimes believe that spiritual food is like, well, spiritual tryptophan. They, they hear from the preacher and that lulls them to sleep. <laughs> Until the next time, the bell rings, bing, bing, time to eat again, right? And then we get spiritually fat. We do. We get spiritually fat and we, and we say, what's going on? We're to bring in that spiritual strength. We're to bring it in so that we can burn it up and use it up. And then we can bring some more in. Burn it up and use it up. Amen. But I'm here to tell you the best food and drink we could ever partake in is on this table right here. And we're invited to come and partake. We're invited to come and partake and draw our spiritual strength from the Lord Jesus Christ. You're here today and you have never accepted Christ as your Savior. You cannot partake. But why is that? Are you closed or something? No. Well, what are you? <laughs> A lot of people have asked. The point is, this is for those in remembrance of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for them. And since you have not allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to do for you what He's done for them, there's nothing to remember. Nothing. But you can fix that today. You can fix that today. Amen? In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. You can come and you can accept Christ. We'll, we'll, we'll give you all of what the Bible says about salvation. And you right here, right now, can, can have the opportunity <coughs> to accept Christ. There are those of us that need this invitation now because we need to make sure we're clean. Clean hands, clean heart.
We need to take just a few moments in our invitation to have that clean hands, clean heart. Don't be ready to leave. Don't fidget, don't what have you. But in just a moment, we're going to have our invitation, and then we're going to go right into the Lord's Supper. It is time to take to heart that which we've been taught today from the Holy Spirit. Amen. So here it is. You ready? Number one. If you're here today and you have never